first met our speaker, Dr. Steve McPhee, uh, at the Medical Policy Committee for Blue Shield. We both serve that committee. He serves it more than I do, but we're both uh, serving that committee to help Blue Shield of California decide what new technologies to cover. Uh, Dr. McPhee, McPhee is a near legendary figure there, I think, in that he produces every month or every quarter something that looks more or less like your telephone book and analyzes all of the new technologies that have been proposed to Blue Shield, analyzes them across the whole range of medicine, makes sense out of them, and then makes recommendations concerning them. And the thing that's astonished me is that even the people who come in with a vested interest wanting to see this go forward generally give him bouquets for having done a great job of e even when he recommends against them, uh, which I think is pretty amazing. Dr. McPhee did his undergraduate work at Yale University in philosophy. He then went on to medicine at Johns Hopkins University, where he also did his residency in internal medicine. He is professor of internal medicine at UCSF, and has had the privilege, I think, of teaching some Loma Linda graduates, including one recent one, Shane Bailey. Some of you may know Shane, who's been up there. Dr. McPhee is known not only for his expertise in medicine, which is extensive and which I just mentioned I used to sell books, so I'll put this one up here. The 1999 revised edition of Current Medical Diagnosis and Treatment, he's one of the authors of this book, and unlike other medical texts, it comes out every year revised, so that it hits the street fairly new and at a reasonable price, I think, so. <laughs> Which cover would you like to have this in? Uh, in any case, uh, I just thought I would uh, hold that up as show and tell to let you know that Dr. McPhee is a, a nationally recognized expert in internal medicine and, of course, a published author in that field. He's also known, though, for the spiritual care of patients, something at Loma Linda that we might call whole person care, which has been a central theme of this university and its medical center for many decades. And it's really on that topic more than his medical expertise, one might say, or the bringing together of those that he comes to us today. His title uh, is The Practice of Presence. And we have a handout, and you should all have a copy of that. If you don't, you'll be needing it. And I, without further ado, we're going to turn the time over to Dr. McPhee. Please join me in welcoming. Before I begin, let me acknowledge the remarkable book entitled On Presence by the philosopher Ralph Harper. My thoughts today evolved out of reading, rereading, and reflecting on this book. You may remember that several years ago, PBS featured a provocative series by Bill Moyers entitled Healing and the Mind. The final episode was called Wounded Healers. In it, Moyers featured the important work done by Dr. Rachel Remen and Michael Lerner at Commonweal in Bolinas, California. Let me begin by having you read in silence a story from Rachel Remen about a patient there called The Gift of Healing. It's in your handout. When you've finished reading it, please look up so that I'll know you're done. In her interview with Moyers, Rachel Remen talks about how a cancer diagnosis creates a boundary situation. Serious illness like this patient's cancer is isolating, and patients fear isolation almost more than anything else. She says, you feel separated from the whole human race. Somehow it's like looking at the whole world through a plate of glass. You can see them, but you can't touch them or be with them. That's loneliness. That's what everyone who comes here talk about. In fact, just about everybody. 
being terminally ill with cancer is one example of what Carl Jaspers has called boundary situations. Situations of existential crisis, such as suffering, guilt, strife, violence, indecision, loneliness, failure, rejection, time running out, and death. These existential crises represent the darker side of life and yet are inescapable. People in situations of existential crisis often turn to their physicians for help. My sense is that many of us physicians do not know how to respond to them. Instead, we find ourselves face to face with our limits. Franz Kafka, in his short story, A Country Doctor, says, to write prescriptions is easy, but to come to an understanding with people is hard. How can we, as physicians, help our patients in these situations? What do we have to offer? I think that what we really have to offer simply is our own presence, our connection, engagement, relationship with the patient. Boundary situations such as suffering, guilt, loneliness, or death have immediacy, force, and authority. These situations cannot be ignored by the patient or physician. Ralph Harper contends that presence is central to one trying to find an exit from boundary situations. Something in the human spirit pleads for counterparts in presence in the immediacy, force, and authority of presence. This is because each one of us does not really see himself or herself except in the mirror on the wall or in the mirror of another's eyes. Like many others with cancer, the patient in this story wants a reassurance that he is not ultimately alone. He wants someone to receive him, to let him know that his pain and suffering, his fear matters. <coughs> Notice how he pleads for the immediacy and force and authority of his physician's presence. What the patient really values from his oncologist is not the chemotherapy, he's willing to stop it, but the sitting together <coughs> and talking quietly for a few minutes, which follows it. He continues the rigors of chemotherapy just to be present with his doctor. He uses the words friendship and even love to describe the relationship he wants with his physician. The unfortunate thing here is that his physician seems closed to the patient's presence when it is offered and is totally unable to give his whole attention, the gift of himself as a whole, to the one who needs it. The story ends on a powerful note of isolation, the physician's isolation. The oncologist has so restricted his ability to respond to the patient that he cannot perceive the very validation he himself seeks in his work, even when it is right in front of him. Rachel Remen says elsewhere that physicians are often sitting in the front row of life, but with their eyes closed. The way we as physicians can avoid situations like this is to learn the practice of presence, to learn the habits of availability, listening, exchange, and reflection. What is presence? We commonly refer to someone as having presence, as if presence was something put on like a suit of clothes, something separate from the whole person. But this is wrong. Presence is really a mode of being. The philosopher Gabriel Marcel says that presence is something which reveals itself immediately in a look, a smile, an intonation, or a handshake, this real presence is a kind of influx. Someone who is truly present can renew me. Someone not really present, even if that person is in front of me talking away, does not make his or her whole being felt. But when someone's presence does really make itself felt, it can refresh my inner being. It reveals me to myself. It makes me more fully myself than I should be if I were not exposed to its impact. We remember persons who have had such influence on us. We do not feel the same when they are near. 
They seem to have the power to define our own character. Harper says, we sometimes feel we are in the presence of someone qualitatively different from others, and we remember their quality long after they have gone from us. They affect us differently from those who are closed to us. With them and through them, we seem to leave the subject-object world and penetrate a land of participation, acceptance, understanding. Around them, we feel the whole world a more vibrant as well as a more interesting place. Let me illustrate what presence is in another story, a story by a medical student of an obstetrics resident. Please read in silence the story called five perfect fingers. When you're done with it, please look up so I'll know you're done. This is a remarkable illustration of how a physician's presence can transform a devastating, seemingly hopeless situation into one with renewed hope. The obstetric resident turns a very negative situation inside out. The resident acknowledges death explicitly. In a manner that is vivid and unforgettable, he shows the mother the face of death. But notice the care with which the resident has prepared for the scene that follows. He has already shown the infant to the father, allowing him time to grieve on his own to be more ready to support his wife. He has placed the baby on a small cot and covered it. The two physicians stand next to the two parents in a symbolic gesture of solidarity and union. When the resident uncovers the baby, he stays silent and allows the mother to express her pent-up emotion. Then he speaks. Although the resident says very little, a total of five sentences, notice that he emphasizes first what was normal, indeed perfect, about the baby. He explains away the head deformity in simple, non-medical terms, reassuring the parents that it resulted from the birthing process and not from a congenital malformation. Then he makes the transforming statement. He uses the baby's perfect features to express his confidence that they can have a normal baby. He recognizes that in any situation of stillbirth or miscarriage or congenital malformation, there is the parent's fear that they will never be able to have a normal child. What the parents need is hope, indeed confidence, that they will be able to do so. Note that the resident deliberately chooses to focus on what was good here and not to blame the mother for the poor control of her diabetes or the untoward outcome. After this is done, the resident and student have the presence of mind to allow the parents time to grieve alone with their child. The obstetric resident manifests his presence in a second way. He teaches the third year student how to acknowledge death explicitly and how to transform grief into hope. He models a behavior that the apprentice can now emulate. And the student, by sharing the story, does the same for us. Presence is remarkable. Harper distinguishes several marks or characteristics of presence. Things such as time present, giving, totality, and intimacy. What is meant by time present as a mark of presence? When two people are present to one another, there is a real sense of being in the present moment in the here and now. Harper gives an example. I have sat by dying friends and know what it is like to participate in another person's life as it ebbs. We experience a fragment of time, a now, a dissolving of barriers. Presence suggests an alternative way of thinking about time as a filled present. Instead of as something recovered from the past by memory or as something anticipated in the future by fantasy. Remember Pascal's warning? We never keep to the present. We anticipate the future as if we found it too slow in coming and we're trying to hurry it up. Or we recall the past 
as if to stay its too rapid flight. We are so unwise that we wander about in times that do not belong to us and do not think of the only one that does. Thus, we never actually live, but hope to live. What is meant by giving as a mark of presence? When we say that someone is a presence or has presence, we mean that he or she seems to be giving him or herself, even imposing himself or herself. And we feel that we are in the presence of a whole someone. Presence is marked by totality or wholeness. Presence is an experience of oneness in the middle of the fragmentation that is the curse of modern consciousness. It is a unitary experience and an experience of totality in the midst of shattering differences. Finally, presence is marked by intimacy. Think of examples from ordinary life, situations in which we see the human warmth behind the gift of a whole to a whole. I think of my own experiences of real presence as a fellow with my mentor, as a parent with my children, as a teacher with my students, as a son with my dying mother, as a physician with my patients. Or I think of the intimacy that sometimes occurs between two persons lucky enough to experience the miracle of giving and receiving. These qualities of time present, giving, totality, and intimacy create a kind of bonded resonance, bonded resonance between two individuals. Harper concludes, what do I mean by presence? When I am moved by the presence of another, I feel the distance between me and the other dissolve to some degree, and I feel at ease. I feel that there is briefly no past and no future, and I am content. I feel that what I know makes me more myself than I knew before. Or as Kathy says to Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights, more myself than I am. Where is presence in the relationship between patient and physician? Presence can be experienced along each of the three dimensions, the three axes of a fully three-dimensional human life, the intrapersonal, the interpersonal, and the transpersonal axes. That is the I-I relationship, the I-Thou with the small T relationship, and the I-Thou with the capital T relationship. Today, in focusing on the relationship between patient and physician, we are operating mainly along the I-Thou, interpersonal axis. But we must acknowledge that there are other manifestations of presence, and thus other practices of presence. In the interpersonal domain, there is no presence without some kind of encounter. Presence is never strictly a solitary experience. Presence is possible in the relationship between physician and patient. Dr. Anthony Sukman, in writing about the physician-patient relationship, uses the word connection with an X. I like that word because the X in it reminds me of the intersection in a real encounter, engagement, relationship between a doctor and a patient. The philosopher Gabriel Marcel was interested in the relations between persons as manifestations of presence. Perhaps Marcel's single most important insight is his insistence that what truly makes a person human is his or her capability for being open to others. In the clinical encounter, we can understand this as what truly makes a physician human is his or her capability for being open to patients. How can presence be practiced? Realize first that presence is elusive, but intuitions of its reality arise from our lived experience. Harper says, moments, meetings, persons are our verification. In the stillness of being with someone else, we may touch on something that gives a sense of something great we have been waiting for. It is very important to seize such moments that expand our awareness of what we would like to be. 
If we think about it, the presence of someone who is willing to take us as we are and who offers himself or herself in return is an experience well known to each one of us. It happens within families and in friendships, in teaching, and in healing. But as healers, if we do not wish to waste our entire lives on the threshold of the possibility of presence, never willing to give, and too shut up inside ourselves to receive, we must learn how to practice presence. Presence needs practice. Just to try to be present to someone else beyond the exigencies of our distracted lives requires what Marcel calls a perpetuation of presence. How then can one practice presence? The physician who would practice presence in the I-Thou realm must cultivate four habits. Availability, listening, exchange, and reflection. First, the practice of presence entails an attitude of availability, of putting oneself at the disposal of the other. Marcel says, the person who is at my disposal is the one who is capable of being with me with the whole of himself. Marcel distinguished between our relations to persons as objects and as presences. The difference is tremendous. In the real world, the distinction is between thinking of people as things to be disposed of and thinking of them as places of mystery, inexhaustible and open. Being present in the clinical encounter is difficult because physicians operating from their scientific and technical perspective tend to regard people not as presences but as objects. For instance, how often we physicians find ourselves discussing the disposition of a patient as if he or she were an object to be warehoused. To be present, rather than having an attitude of how to dispose of the patient, the physician would ask how to be at the patient's disposal. Let's look at availability. That is, how a physician puts himself at the disposal of a patient in another story. Please read in silence the story called Communion. When you're done with it, please look up. This story is a powerful illustration of a physician being open to a patient. Faced with his last patient of the day, a young woman with chronic abdominal pain, a sheaf of medical records, and an off-putting manner, the gastroenterologist has every reason to treat her as an object to be disposed of rather than as a presence to be open to. Instead, he reveals his availability in asking himself the question, what could I possibly do for her? Although he asks her to return in a month, she is back a week later. Again, rather than trying to dispose of her, he puts himself at her disposal. Once again, he asks her to return in a, w in a month, and again, she is back a week later, this time more at ease. In asking about the possibility of sexual assault, the physician is not afraid of what he might uncover. But when approaching this difficult area, notice that he asks her permission. Can you tell me about it? Note that the physician is willing to admit his own inadequacy, both to himself and to the patient. The patient, having come to trust this physician, refuses to be sent on to yet another doctor. The physician responds to his perceived inadequacy by reading about rape and eating disorders and by discussing her with a psychiatrist colleague. More importantly, the physician schedules weekly meetings. Late in the day, so that the patient has time to talk as long as she wants. During these visits, the physician mostly listens. In the end, although the physician might have worried that making himself available to this needy patient would require an infinite amount of time, his availability was rewarded. There was a remarkable transformation in the patient, 
with visible changes in her manner and appearance, a gradual lengthening of the interval between her visits, and eventually a return to health. In his book, I and Thou, the theologian Martin Buber writes that presence is a relation between persons, a continuum of address and response that gives meaning to life. Real life is meeting, says Buber, the meeting of one who is willing to open himself or herself to another self. In this sense, reality is the bonds between people in this instant, between the patient and physician. Presence is more than something felt. It must be something shared. In this sense, presence may be the onset of what we sometimes call intimacy, of what Buber calls the between. Second, the practice of presence means listening. In her recent book, Rachel Remen says, the first and most powerful technique of healing is simply listening, just listening. One of the greatest gifts you can give another person is your attention. Practicing presence means listening well. Listening well involves focusing wholly on the patient facing you. Listening well means finding the time necessary. Listening well involves silence. Listening well means knowing that not having the answer may be the right response. Listening well involves being still, being willing to do nothing. In the charting room on the ward where I trained at Hopkins, there was posted the Buddhist adage, don't just do something, sit there. Practicing presence means listening carefully. Listening carefully means bearing witness to the patient's situation. Listening carefully involves letting the patient tell her whole story, hearing the story that is in the other. Listening carefully involves listening with one's heart as well as one's ears. In the practice of medicine, we use our sense of hearing and auscultation. In the practice of presence, we use our sense of common humanity in compassion. Practicing presence means listening deeply. Listening deeply involves determining the source and direction of the deeper currents below the surface. Listening deeply means not being afraid of the unstructured nature of the conversation, not being afraid of the undefined destination of the exploration even if it takes us into places never planned or into places we'd rather not go. Listening deeply involves actively reflecting the patient's own meaning without judgment or advice. The opposite of the act of judgment is appreciation. When we listen to another without judgment, we appreciate them as they are in that moment. Let's look at what listening well, carefully, deeply looks like in a final story of the relationship between a physician, a child, and his parents. Please read in silence the story called The Gift of Listening. When you're done, please look up. with a child and his parents, even though he no longer had any official role in his care. The pediatrician has the medical and scientific expertise to recognize that the child's death is imminent and unpreventable. But he also has the insight to recognize the problem that he might help to solve, that his, patient, his parents were completely unprepared for this eventuality. What happens then is doubly remarkable. First, for the inspiration the physician has, a thought occurred to me to encourage the parents to listen to their infant, and second, for the courage he has to trust his instinctive response. Despite his own reservations about the idea, which I initially rejected as inappropriate to my role or training, he decides to proceed precisely because the thought had come in response to a desire to help. That is, he listens to himself. The transition to their acceptance of the death occurs gradually, 
and the physician is patient in brokering it. He asks the parents if they had been listening to their child, if they had been open to the possibility that he might have something he needed to tell them. Notice that the child's mother describes becoming very still in order to listen to her baby. Her response is to become peaceful over the child's critical status for the first time. The father interprets the message from his child that he is OK to mean that he will recover. The physician, instead of contradicting him, simply asks them to continue listening. After the father's second message, the physician helps them to overcome their distress and confusion by carefully interpreting it to indicate that the impending death is acceptable to the child. When the parents express reluctance, the physician says that he understands it, but he asks them to go along with this interpretation for a while to see what happened. He asks them to consider the possibility that the dying child needs their permission, something they have the power to grant. Several days later, the parents achieve the realization that the child's survival is not the only acceptable result for them. The sign of resolution is that when the child then dies, the parents experience a profound sense of peace and are able to complete their grieving soon after. Third, the practice of presence involves an exchange with the patient. Harper says, when I speak of the elusiveness of presence, I am not thinking only of the idea of presence and how difficult it is to define. I am thinking also about the difficulties of practicing presence, of unconditional giving. That needs two, each setting an example for the other. You cannot practice presence all by yourself. There must be mutual dependence and exchange. From Marcel's perspective, a full experience of presence requires reciprocity, the exchange which is the mark of all spiritual life. What does this exchange look like? Exchange occurs when you, as a clinician, offer something of yourself, your own vulnerabilities. That is, when you recognize, admit, and even share your own woundedness. Exchange can mean a mutuality of understanding and acceptance. Harper says, when I think of someone I really care for, I feel an exchange of understanding and acceptance. Sometimes exchange means a sympathetic dialogue. Marcel says, there is a way of listening which is a way of giving. Harper continues, there is a way of speaking, too, that is a way of giving. And when we give or receive, we cease to be strangers. For the giving and the receiving reveal the self behind them, what Marcel calls the total spiritual availability. In the practice of presence, exchange sometimes involves substitution. Substitution means imagining the patient to be you yourself, mentally putting yourself in the other's shoes. Substitution means imagining the patient in front of you to be a loved one. Substitution means that our attitudes as physicians should not be there but for the grace of God go I, but rather there go I. Martin Buber wrote about exchange and substitution. Through the thou, a man becomes I. Through the thou, a man becomes I. The poet E.E. E. Cummings expressed it more cryptically. I am through you, so I. The concept of substitution thus goes beyond sympathetic listening. It can remove from your patient the devastating loneliness, fear of suffering, and by doing so create a sense of peace. Substitution, says Harper, is the test of the sincerity of presence. Thus, exchange may be a sharing of vulnerabilities, a mutual acceptance and understanding, a verbal exchange, an act of substitution, or a sense of the mutual reward of giving and receiving. Each of the stories we've read today illustrates the exchange that can occur when a patient and physician are present to one another. In the first story we read, the obstetrics resident does what he does for the mother because otherwise she'll never know that hope is possible. As the student leaves, he glances back and is rewarded by seeing the mother touch the baby's hand with its five perfect fingers 
in an acknowledgement of her acceptance and her understanding, her love, and her hope. In communion, the exchange of understanding and acceptance between the young woman and the gastroenterologist is unmistakable in the last scene. In fact, the patient gives her doctor a gift. Her present is an exquisitely appropriate, deliciously edible offering, a symbol of their communion. The real exchange between them is clear when she says, thank you for believing in me, and he says, I should say the same. The patient's tears, her kiss, and her teasing parting shot, and the physician's feeling warmed like the sun, exhilarated and full of love for his profession, confirm the depth of the encounter. The physician reflects that he had been chosen to receive a gift of trust, and of all the gifts he had ever received, none seemed as precious. In the story about Daniel, too, the physician calls his experience a gift. It is some seven years later that he writes the story of the conversation that occurred between the child, the family, and himself. He characterizes it as an exchange. And it is clear that he means more than an exchange of words. I have also wondered who received the greatest gift from this wonderful exchange. The theologian Charles Williams wrote about what this exchange might mean for us as physicians. To take over the grief or the fear or the anxiety of another. To take over the grief or the fear or the anxiety of another. To be present to someone in a boundary situation, you must be willing to share his or her suffering. W. H. Auden said, no one can carry his own burden. He only can and therefore must carry someone else's. No one can carry his own burden. He only can and therefore must carry someone else's. Finally, it is not enough to say, be available, listen, and give yourself. The physician who would practice presence must develop the habit of reflection. How does one develop the habit of reflection? I think one begins by finding silence and becoming still. Silence and stillness are required for reflection to grow, just as water and sunlight are required for a seed to germinate and grow. Only in silence can one hear the still, small voice within. Let me tell you about how, in my own life and work, reflection has been a direct outgrowth of finding silence and becoming still. One of the best pieces of advice I ever received as a young physician was to spend some time each day in complete silence. Every day, I try to find some time, often no more than 20 minutes, just sitting in a kind of silent meditation. It constantly amazes me what comes to the surface as a result. In addition, every year for the last 17 years, I have scheduled a week of retreat in rural Oregon. Much of this time of retreat is spent in silence, in reading and writing, walking in the woods. Some of the time is spent in becoming still, in bird watching, meditation, looking at the stars, this week is a precious time to me, a time that I look forward to all the rest of the year and carry with me, in some sense, every day. In Oregon, there is time to reassess where I've been and where I'm going as a physician and as a person. There is time to deal with the boundary situations that have occurred in my own life, the death of my one-and-a-half-year-old son, David, from a brain tumor, the devastating stroke of my brother, John, and his subsequent hospitalizations, the prolonged illness and eventual death of my mother, the death of my mother-in-law, and the suicide of a former resident. In my work, too, reflection has grown out of finding silence and becoming still. In the mid-1980s, I began to schedule annual retreats with our primary care residents and faculty. Last year, half of the group went in November and half in January to a lodge and cabins in a redwood grove on the coast. At these one-day retreats, we usually spend some free time, some time in meditation, some time in writing exercises, 
and sometime in discussion of a topic related to the process of becoming a physician. For example, how to take care of oneself so that one doesn't burn out. As an outgrowth of one of these retreats, three years ago, we started a series of evening meetings of our residents and faculty called Doctoring to Heal. Each month, this two-hour session provides us an opportunity to share our own stories of practicing medicine and to support each other. We usually focus on a difficult patient issue, for example, caring for terminally ill patients, or on a problem faced by physicians, for example, making a mistake. We begin each evening by asking participants to write in silence about an incident relating to the issue. We end with the reading, usually in silence, of a story or poem, just like the stories you've read today. I know that finding silence and becoming still takes time, and that sometimes not even 20 minutes is available. Then the trick is to find the time for reflection in what I already have to do. For example, in my clinic, when I enter an exam room to see a patient, I always start the encounter by washing my hands. I now try to spend that 15 or 20 seconds in silence, reflecting on where this patient is in his or her current situation and what I might do to help. Another example, while attending on the wards last July, I sat in silence for part of an hour with a man who was dying so that his extended family went to the cafeteria for a meal together and he would not be alone. I tell you these things not to say that these are things you must do. Rather, I mention these things because in the midst of a very busy life, it has been possible for me to find, to make the time for them. Developing your own habit of reflection may include some of the things I've mentioned, but more likely will involve things that are uniquely your own. But the practice of presence demands that you develop the habit of reflection, that you find silence and become still. Developing the habit of reflection will lead to a certain depth of character. Absent in the first, and present in the last three of the four physicians in the stories we read today. In this contrast is the difference between those who are encumbered with themselves and those who are capable of focus on others. Harper says, the lesson in that is to be fully human and to be a presence, a man or woman must have some equivalent of contemplation some experience with reflection or meditation that can give time for the inner self to expand. Charity, love if you prefer, is not a mechanical act. It is an overflowing of carefully gathered treasure. Out of the depths come tentative proffers of attention and help. Out of the depths come riches that do not really belong to us and are not ours to withhold. In his interview with Bill Moyers at Commonweal, Michael Lerner acknowledges that we would all give anything to help someone recover physically from diseases such as cancer or AIDS. But from the beginning of time, our inability to do so has been the human condition. The task we face is helping the patient and ourselves to have a different perspective on it, a perspective that includes all the pain, all the suffering, all the anger, and all the sorrow. Lerner asks, can we open up and discover anything, anything besides pain and sorrow? Is there anything worthwhile in this very difficult thing that we have been given to deal with? I think we can discover in each other's presence what is truly worthwhile.
mentioned, you're welcome to come to lunch with us in the cafeteria here in this facility uh, where we'll have a chance to talk about these ideas. So thank you again. For